The scripture reading this morning before the lesson comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Ephesians 2, 1 through 13, and I'll be reading from the New King James. And you have made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you were once caught, walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom... Also, we all once conducted them ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it, it, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, <clears throat> that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. A life without hope is a miserable life. Hope is confident expectation. It is that which is desired and expected. Hope sustains the soul because hope looks forward to better times. We've even developed our own adages to express the idea of hope. Anyone ever heard, this too shall pass? Someone was attempting to encourage another to hang on and press forward in spite of present challenges. Consider the following three simple yet unavoidable facts. Number one, sin condemns. Number two, the word of God convinces. And number three, the blood of Christ converts. Where are we in relation to those three facts? Do we stand condemned in sin? Have we been convinced of the facts of the gospel, but have we obeyed them? Have we been converted to the truth, and are we walking in the light of the truth? We're one of those three things today. We're condemned, we're convinced, or we're converted, which are you. That's today's sermon title, Condemned, Convinced, or Converted. Three things we want to talk about today. Guess what they are. Good. We're going to be in Ephesians 2. We're going to look through verses 1 through 13, and we're going to have three main ideas from this text. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, we're going to talk about the condemned. Notice verse 1. And you hath he quickened, that is, made alive, who were, that's past tense, who were dead, that is, separated, separated in. They weren't separated from, they were separated in trespasses and sin. So by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul reminds those who were now made alive in Christ Jesus of their previous spiritual condition. What were they? They were dead in trespasses and sins. Trespasses and sins are very close in meaning, but there's a slight difference. Trespasses means a deviation from that which is correct. Perhaps the idea of trespasses emphasizes the harm that is done when we sin, when we trespass against God. Sins brings the idea of to miss the mark, 
And it emphasizes the fact. The fact is we have sinned and harm has been done from that sin. Now what's the harm? We're dead. What's the idea of death in the Bible? Separation. And notice that little word in. You hath he quickened who were dead in. That emphasizes a point of location. And it shows the close relationship that those who were dead, where were they dead? Where was their relationship? What was their close association? In trespasses and sins. Notice verse number 2 as we continue talking about the condemned. Wherein in time past. That means he's looking backward. In time past, ye walked, you lived, you conducted yourselves according to the course of this world. You know what the course of this world is? Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 1 John 2, 16. That's a simple summary. Notice it. Wherein in time past ye walked, lived, according to the course of this world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, according to the prince of the power of the air. That seems to be another biblical description for Satan, the devil. The spirit, that is the disposition, the attitude, the outlook, that now, it still continues, that now work eth keeps on working in the children of disobedience. The sad reality is that though some are no longer lost, there are still some who are lost. They are the condemned. How are they condemned? They're condemned in trespasses and sins because they're walking not according to what God teaches, but according to the rules and regulations established by the devil. Verse number three, look at this reminder. Don't miss this. Among whom? Wouldn't that be the children of disobedience? Among whom? He doesn't say you all and exclude himself. He says we all, including the apostle Paul. Among whom we all had. Notice the past tense. Notice this. Among whom also we all had our conversation, our conduct, our manner of life in times past. Not anymore with Paul and others. Though some were still living that way, but Paul says, among whom we all had our conversation, our conduct, our manner of life in times past, in the lusts, the unlawful desires of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, the word nature here as it's used, means a long time habit or custom. You know what's true? Like begats like. And when we live and wallow in trespasses and sins, you know what typically we continue to bring forth in that condition? Trespasses and sins. We learn how to do that. And we're by nature, learn, practice, or habit, the children of wrath. Now notice verse number 2 is still working in the children of disobedience, but we were. Paul includes himself. What were we? Children of wrath, even as others. Now, do you see that the wrath comes upon the disobedient? The children of wrath, the children of disobedience, the disobedient ones get the wrath. And the wrath comes upon the disobedient. They're the condemned. So what does all this mean? So what, preacher? Well, 1 John 3, 4 tells us what sin is. Whosoever committeth. Notice it. It doesn't say catcheth. Whosoever committeth sin misses the mark. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. God says, don't we did, and we died. Do you see that? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 tells us what sin does. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now some sit here and hear this and say, boy, I'm glad he's talking about everybody else. He's getting somebody told. I don't know who he's talking about, but he sure is getting somebody told. Listen to what the Bible says on how universal the sin problem is from Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Are you sitting here today condemned in trespasses and sins? 
Does anyone still see it? Because the Apostle Paul said, Brethren, you need to reflect. You need to look back and remember that once upon a time, you too were condemned in trespasses and sins. Well, let's move forward. Let's talk now in the second place about the convinced in Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 10. There are many who are convinced of most things taught in the Bible. Now, I ask politely, are convinced and converted the same thing? No, they are not. Convinced and converted are not the same thing. You understand that some defend the truth of God while they're condemned in sin. You do realize that. So let's look through this passage, Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 10, and let's look at it from the, eye, from the eyes of the convinced. Verse number 4 says, But God, look at that contrast. But God, who is rich in mercy. Notice, not who was, but who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. You know that there are some who are convinced of the mercy and love of God for humanity, and they sit still in the pew. They don't budge. They sit right there. They're convinced of the mercy and love of God and they never move from the pew. Verse number five, even when we were dead, separated in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. There are some who are convinced that sin condemns and God gives us spiritual life through Jesus Christ. And they sit in the pews and they never move. They're convinced, but they don't budge. They don't move. Verse number six, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. Look at the location. Where are these heavenly places? In Christ Jesus. Not the heavenly places in trespasses and sins. Heaven, as if there were such a thing. Where are these heavenly places? Where are they located? In Christ Jesus, some are convinced that the Lord adds all the saved to the one true church. And they sit still in the pews. They'll teach you the truth about the Lord's church, and they're not a member of it. Notice verse number 7. That in the ages to come, so long as time continues, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Some are convinced of the grace and kindness of God both in the here and the hereafter. And you know what they do? They don't budge from the pews. They sit right there, follow along in their Bibles. They take notes. They listen attentively. They don't sleep. But they don't budge. They're convinced but friend, I ask you again politely, is convinced the same thing as converted? It is not. It is not. Verse number 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Look at it again. What's God's part? God's part is summarized as grace. What's man's part? It's summarized as faith. What meets in the middle? Saved. When God does his part, man does his part, what meets in the middle? Do you see it? Grace, faith, what's between them? Saved. God does his part, grace. Man does his part. Summarize it. Faith, what meets in the middle? Do you see it? For by grace, God's part, are you saved in the middle through faith? God's part is grace. Man's part is faith. And when they come together, saved is in the middle. Do you see that? And that, that's not talking about faith. It's going back either to grace or salvation by grace. Either one. That not of yourselves. Grace is God's unmerited favor. If God didn't give us grace, how would we ever be saved? If he hadn't told us what we need to do, how could we ever figure it on our own? So faith is not the gift of God. It is grace or salvation by grace. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What's our point? Some are convinced that salvation is no more by grace alone than it is by faith alone. And yet 
they sit in the pews. They do not budge. They'll make eye contact. They'll look at you. They'll listen. They'll write down what's said. But they don't budge from the pews. Verse number 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You realize some are convinced of the four different types of works used in the New Testament. You're aware of that? They're the works of the flesh, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. That's sin. They're the works of the law of Moses, Galatians 2, 16. Those cannot save. What he's probably talking about here in Ephesians 2, 9 is the works of human merit. That is the works we devise on our own. Perhaps you'd illustrate it like this. You help an old lady across the road, now I'm going to heaven. Not of works. Not of the works of human merit, lest any should boast. But have you read James 2 recently? There are the works that God requires, the works of obedience. But he says here, not of works. Well, it's not of sinful works. It's not of the works of the law of Moses. But what he's talking about is it's not of human works. We cannot devise our own plan to make ourselves right with God. And if we could, then somebody could boast. But he says it's not of works, not of the works of human merit, lest any should boast. Some are convinced that there are four different types of works in the New Testament, and they sit glassy-eyed in the pews. And they don't budge. They're convinced, but they're not converted. Verse number 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Some are convinced, members of the church of Christ, Christians are expected to do good works, but they never budge from the pew. They sit right there and do not budge. Friend, I ask you again, is convinced the same as converted? Because if you're not careful, you can be convinced and you're still condemned. You can be convinced that the Bible is right. But until we do all of what the New Testament teaches to be right, we're still condemned, even though we've been convinced. So what does all this mean? Well, none are converted until they're first convinced of the truth recorded in the Bible. However, convinced and converted are not the same. They are not synonyms. Now consider the simple truth declared by Jesus in Matthew 7, 24 through 27, Wherefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, watch it, and doeth them, doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it what's the difference hear and do or hear and do not do you understand the difference between the convinced and the converted from that simple illustration given by Jesus in Matthew 24, 7, rather, 24 through 27, the convinced must become doers. That means this. What does that mean? That means you're going to have to turn loose of that pew. You've got, you got to come up out of the pew. Now, third, let's talk about the converted from Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. Notice verse 11. Wherefore, there's a conclusion word. Remember, reflect upon this, members of the Lord's church. Wherefore, remember that ye, you all. Now he said we, now it's ye. Reflect upon this. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hand. See all that language? Uncircumcision refers, generally speaking, in the Bible to the Gentiles. Circumcision in the flesh made by hands, what do you think that would be? That's Bible language to refer to those who were Jews. Now observe that Paul instructs those now in Christ Jesus to remember their former way of life. 
Brethren, it is therefore necessary for us to remember our previous spiritual condition in order to better appreciate the blessings we now have in Christ. Reflect on it. What was so great about being condemned in trespasses and sins? You know the answer to that? Nothing. There was nothing great about that at all. Was there? Verse number 12. That at that time. Now there are six points in this verse. Notice what they are. That at that time. When? When you were Gentiles lost. Watch. That at that time you were number one without Christ. You were separated from all spiritual blessings. Number two, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Now, if you're an alien, you know what that says? You're not a citizen. So they, again, were separated from where all spiritual blessings were located. Being aliens, strangers from the commonwealth of Israel. And number three, strangers from the covenants of promise. Strangers from the covenants of promise, well, that's kind of similar to an alien, isn't it? A stranger is one who is not recognized. What do you tell your children about strangers? Generally, don't we say, don't talk to strangers? So what's a stranger? A stranger is one who is not recognized. And here it would be favorably by God. Number four, this is important. Having, what did he say? I didn't say it. What did he say by inspiration of the Holy Spirit? How much hope was there in that lost spiritual condition Dead in trespasses and sins. In that condition, how much hope was there? He said, having no hope. He didn't say it wrong, did he? Did he say it wrong? Did he write it wrong? No. There is no hope for anyone who lives in rebellion to God. That's the idea. And number five, without God. Without God means you're cut off from him. You don't have access to all the hope and the spiritual blessings. And then number six is pretty plain, isn't it? In the world. What does that word in mean? It shows our location. It shows the closeness of the relationship that we had with the world. So in the world means this. Every accountable person is either in the world or you're in the church. Where's the middle ground? You say the safe, well, well, they're safe. Every person who has sinned, every person to whom Romans 3.23 applies, guess what? You're either in the world or you're in the church. And if you're in the church, you need to be faithful in order to receive the blessings of being in Christ or in the church. Is that true? That's true. There is no middle ground. Do you see that? But notice verse number 13. But now. But is a strong contrast now, right now, at this very moment when Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to record this. But now in, where were they now? Reflect on where they had been. Where were they now? Where are they now? Now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off. Notice that. Ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh. You're brought close by what? It doesn't say by the imagination of mankind. It says by the blood of Christ. Now, when they were far off, they were dead. Watch this. Dead in sins and trespasses. That's Bible language, is it not? Didn't we read that in this context? Yes. Matthew one twenty one. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Romans 6 teaches, those that, teaches us that those who have been baptized with Christ have died to sins. Do you see that? If we don't die to sins and let Jesus save us from our sins, we'll die in our sins. And you don't want to go where everyone who goes who dies in their sins. We have to die to our sins. Let Jesus wash us from our sins before we die in our sins now notice they were far off they were lost they were in the world and unacceptable but now what are they they're made nigh what does that mean they're saved they're in Christ they're acceptable to God now what does all this mean so what you understand that the only thing that separates the condemned 
from the converted is the blood of Jesus Christ. You do realize that, right? Let me give you some scriptures. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed, you were not bought back with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with what redeemed us, Peter? But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Well, what about Revelation 1.5 when you're looking there at greetings from the Godhead, greetings and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Watch it unto him that loved us and washed us, washed us from, washed us from our sins in, in what? He washed us from our sins in his own blood. What washed us from our sins, according to Revelation 1 5? His own blood. Where do I meet the blood of Christ? Let me give you something you can connect together. Watch. It's not very difficult. Acts 22 16. Ananias speaking to Saul of Tarsus at the time, but by the time he records it or it's stated in Acts 22, he's Paul the Apostle. Ananias looked at Saul and said, And now, why tarryest thou? You've been here praying and fasting for three days. What's happening? What's happening? You might become convinced, but you're still not converted. Right now, Saul, you're condemned. And now, why tarryest thou? Arise, so to speak. Get up out of that pew. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. Where does Jesus wash us from our sins? Where does he wash away our sins? It's when we're baptized, when we're immersed in water for the remission of sins. Isn't that plain? Three simple facts, friend. Sin condemns. The word of God convinces. The blood of Christ converts. Where are we right now? Where are we with regard to those three facts? Where are we? The place of spiritual safety is not in the world. It is in the church. It is in Christ Jesus. Do we have hope? When we're in Christ, we have hope. When we're lost in the world, in that condition, we don't desire or expect anything positive or should we? You ever heard of being in the gap? Some right now might be placed in the gap. You know what the gap is? It's where you're right here, right where this microphone is. On the one hand, you cannot deny what has been stated. But you don't have the courage to get up and obey it. Where do you need to be? Get out of the gap. Because you can be stuck in the gap. You need to have the courage to get up and obey what you know the Bible teaches to be right. What must I do to be saved? Hear the truth, Acts 18, 8. Believe the truth, Acts 16, 31. Repent of sin, Acts 17, 30. Confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, Acts 8, 37. Be immersed in water for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. What happens when I do that? You're added by the Lord to the church, Acts 2, 41, Acts 2, 47. Well, what happens? Am I, am I never going to sin again? The Bible, Bible doesn't teach that. Even those who've been washed from their sins still may stumble into sin again. Well, what happens when a Christian stumbles into sin? It's Acts 8, 22. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. We're here because we love you, but you've got to come out of the pew. Do so now, as together we stand, and as we sing a song of encouragement.